together and how they start off vertical and the last blocks are are precariously balanced um, define gravity or well, seemingly so but it's actually gravity that's helping to lock them all together until eventually the last one goes in and the whole thing is locked solid and there is the igloo built well, nearly finished there will be another small igloo added to it the main part is your sleeping compartment the next part is for clothing and the last conception is for equipment and that's the proper igloo of this part of the north where it's very windy so you've seen how this is done now so in 100 years time you'll be able to pass that skill down it's actually very difficult it's not something you learn overnight and uh, to make one is tricky you have to find the right snow and you're always tired and cold at the time you need to make one but the advantage of the snow house, the igloo is its insulative properties. The snow itself is full of air, and so it's very, very warming. And here inside, you see Levy with his kudlik, which is his seal fat lantern. And that is the traditional way of heating an igloo. What I thought when I took the picture, though, he was staring at the lantern in a very distant way he was remembering his childhood. See, he was born in an igloo and the world has so changed in his lifetime as to be almost unrecognisable. I like working with the elders. I've learned a lot about how to work with them and I know that there's always something more that they're not telling you. We went out fishing and they have a particular spear called a kakibak and I asked him about the kakibak and every part of it had a special name and a meaning and a story attached to it. But even the young men, when I questioned them, didn't know those names because their traditional knowledge is becoming unimportant. And that's very interesting because for 99.9% recurring you know, of our history, we were hunter-gatherers. About 12,000 years ago, we came up with this concept of farming, which in my eyes is still an experiment in food gathering because we've still got to prove we can do it without actually destroying our environment. And what you see in these communities is the last vestiges of that hunter-gatherer lifestyle right on its knife edge. Fascinating. But it's not just about the men. The women have a vital role to play, as they always do in these societies. There's an equality in these communities that is difficult to feel here in our society. The men are the hunters and the women, they do vitally important work. They provide the equipment, the clothing that makes it possible for the men to travel. That's one of the things they do. And here you see this old woman again who was born in the old days, whose hands are imbued with the experience of a lifetime working the skins. They still use seal skin footwear because it's better than modern footwear. They still prefer caribou clothing because you can't beat it in that environment. And those women who have modern jobs, who don't have the time, because this is very time consuming, to make traditional clothing, will still make modern clothing for their children out of fleeces, but still cut to tr traditional patterns and designs. Beautiful. And this elder, elderly lady was teaching the young women at a mother's meeting how to tan seal skins and caribou hides, as they've always done. And the little child with his mother doing all of these activities, not popped in a crash somewhere, but at their mother's side learning by absorption the traditions of their way of life. The jackets they use there, the women, they call it an amorti, a mouti, and they put the child in the hood, that's how they travel. And in this remote community where alcohol is prohibited, traditions are still very, very strong. And here in the home, people still dance with the drum, a very special drum, special way of beating the drum, a different way for men, a different way for women. Tremendous symbology, cultural heritage caught up in all of this. 
They still spend time together in the evenings as families. This is something I think that is changing here as the computer game robs us of a generation almost. Their time spent together as a family is very important. I don't know whether you can see, but the gentleman sitting on the couch is the oldest man in the community. He's in his 80s. And you can see he virtually has no neck. Inuit people are very adapted to the cold. They're very stocky, so they have a smaller surface area to lose heat. This is the frontier of human settlement on the planet. Travelling in these sorts of places is a joy, as well as a privilege. And it teaches many things. It's impossible for me to sometimes put onto television how I really feel about places. It's too complex. But there are a few things that um, I'd like to, to share, some ideas I'd like to share with you. The first is that when I travel to really wild parts of the world, quiet corners like here, this is the Central Australian Desert, I look up into the sky above me and I see a sky like you cannot see in Britain. Even in the Lake District, you can't see stars like you see there. Because there's so little pollution, light pollution. When you see meteorites, you can almost see the flames in their tails as they fall as shooting stars. To me, this is the value of wild places, to remind us of what we must be careful not to lose. Because light pollution seeps into our world almost unobserved. In other places, it's about the air, about the water, about stillness. It's hard to find anyone, anywhere in the UK where you can sit and be still and not be interrupted by a human machine. But that stillness, I think, is very important. In both the desert and the Arctic, people were great storytellers. They were philosophers, they were poets, because they had stillness within which to listen to themselves and to reflect on the world around them. And this is, I think, one of the things that we run the risk of losing in our devotion to the mechanized world that we live in. 